We are Life Church Livonia. I am very aware that parenting is not a uh, solo activity, that it is a group activity, right? And uh, that it takes everyone and that we just want you to know that we're committed to you uh, as a family and, and not just to them, but to all of you. And I love that uh, today uh, we're, we get to preach on the topic that we're preaching about today. We've been in a series called Beloved, and really it is an opportunity for you to understand how much God loves you. And so uh, this child dedication is, uh, is kind of an image uh, of what we're talking about is perfect. I can't think of, uh, of a, a, there's very few examples of, of what it looks like to, to be the beloved that are better than this. Because it's clear to me that when we bring Paige before the church and as you see her family with her and her grandparents with her and all of her extended family, it's really clear that Paige Reigns is beloved, isn't it? It's so clear that her parents love her, her extended family loves her, her church family loves her. And so today as we declared that love over her and we promised that we would do everything in our power to help her grow up in that love, uh, what, we, what I hope that you would see is that we feel that same way about all of you. Whether you're a child, whether you're an infant, whether you're an adult coming here for the very first time, uh, that we would pray that all of you, that each of us would come to know the same thing that we're hoping for her. Because what we're hoping is that she would grow up to know that she is the beloved daughter of the Most High King. And what we're praying for you and hoping for you, and the reason that our church exists is that we want you to grow up knowing that you are the beloved son or daughter of the Most High King. Life Church Livonia exists for that very purpose. So the people would have an opportunity to know that truth. We planted this, this church so that people who are far from God would have an opportunity to draw close to him. And that they would come to a place where they realize that before you ever took a single step towards God, God's love was already moving towards you. This is the truth for all of you, that before you ever took a single step towards God, God's love was already moving towards you. His love was already in existence over you and towards you. When you were laying in bed this morning wondering whether or not you should go to church, God was moving towards you. When you were as the farthest you could ever imagine yourself to be away from God, God's love was moving towards you and existed over you. God was already waiting for you with arms spread wide, just asking you to come so that you could be healed, so that you could be transformed, so that you could be rescued from a life lived outside of his purpose and his plan for your life. I believe with everything in me that if you allow God's love to become not just a true thing about you, but the true thing about you, if you allow God's love to become the core truth about your life, you will be transformed. And so this entire series has been about that. This entire series has been an invitation to, to step into that. To not just accept the truth that you are loved by God, but to move into a deeper and deeper relationship with God so that you might not only be the beloved, but you would become the beloved. And the difference is, is that and on the one hand, it's true about you, but you haven't learned to live into it. And on the other, it's true about you and you're pushing into it and you're claiming that is true and you're growing in, in your ability to be uh, every single day acting and living and thinking and moving and breathing as if it was true, that the love of God would become saturated in your life. And so as we've extended that invitation to you, uh, what we've done is invited you to take steps in that direction. And the first step that we ask you to take was to simply declare that you were taken it's a relationship status change. Think about it in terms of online. You go onto Facebook, and if you start dating someone, maybe it's not very serious, but there comes a point when you become Facebook official. When you declare that you are taken by God, what you're saying is, I chose God. I'm choosing God because God first chose me. I'm taken. I'm his. We invited you to stand that week and declare that, and my hope is that uh, as you did that, that it was transformative for you. But there was a moment of public declaration saying, I am taken. 
And the next step that we ask you to, to, to take towards God was to learn to live under the blessing of God. Because a lot of us don't, we know that we're loved by God, we know that we can be forgiven by God, but we don't understand that God wants to heap blessing upon us. There, there's, uh, there are blessings, there are privileges that come with being a part of God's family. He says, I'm going to adopt you. You're be going to become my son, my daughter, my beloved child, and as part, living as part of God's family, there are blessings that come with that, with his presence in your life, with the ability to connect with God, the, a, a God that will hear your prayers and answer your prayers, a God that is close to you when you are struggling and who will never leave you nor forsake you. There are blessings that come with that. And last week, I think, was one of our most powerful moments of communion we've ever had as a church. I don't know about you, but last week was awesome. It was amazing. And I watched you come down the aisles to be prayed over. And we invited members of our prayer team to pray God's blessing over you. And, and I watched then as you moved from that prayer station to the communion station, and most of you had tears in your eyes. And the reason... It's because you experienced the blessing of God. And my hope, my prayer is that that would become a normal and natural part of how we do worship together, of how we do life together. That the prayer team that's in the back every single Sunday would have a line every single Sunday. Because we learned that to be prayed over, to be prayed with, is powerful and it's connectional and it's transformative. And that it allows us to, to touch and to be a part of God's will and God's plan for our life. And the need for people to pray with you and over you is going to become even more apparent today as we take our next step into becoming the beloved. So we first declare that we are taken. And then we, and then we chose to be blessed. And today we accept the reality that we all are broken. That we're all broken, every single one of us. That inside of us there's something that is damaged about every single human being. None of us are perfect. I love what it says in Romans 3.23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't say some have sinned and fall short. It doesn't say that most have sinned and fall short. It says all of us, every single one of us fall short. Every single one of us has a unique way in which we are broken, whether it's emotionally or relationally, whether it's physically. We all have spaces and places in our life where we are broken. And part of the step of becoming the beloved uh, is admitting that, is coming to terms with that, and not just coming to terms with it, but ultimately embracing it. And what I want you to know is that when we admit that we are broken, we find ourselves in really good company. Not just in this room, because we all are broken, but biblically speaking. I want you to think about some of the main characters of the Bible. Think about Joseph, who came from a, a family that was so dysfunctional that his brothers sold him into slavery. Moses, who was called to lead God's people out of Egypt, uh, was terrified of speaking in public. And by the way, he was a murderer. He had killed someone in his youth. And, and you think about Abraham, who, who had all sorts of issues, but one of them was lying. And so you come to Noah and you think, well, Noah, he must have, have not fallen short because God chose him to, to build the ark and to, and to, and to be the one. But, but think about Noah after the, uh, the flood that we find him in God's word getting so drunk that he passes out naked. True story. It's in the Bible. Noah. We think, about, we think about Rahab, who was a prostitute, and yet God chose to write her into the story of our redemption. We think about David, who was an adulterer and also a liar. We think about Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, who we first meet as one of the key persecutors of Christians. This was a guy that hunted, he was like a Christian bounty hunter. Truly going after people who were following Jesus because he felt like they were betraying their faith as Jews and he would go after them and persecute them and in some, time, in some cases oversee their stoning, which meant that he would oversee the murder of Christians. This was Paul. 
We think about Matthew, who was a tax collector, and tax collectors were not known to be good people. They robbed people to line their own pockets. And as you begin to look at the stories, and as you begin to hear uh, all of these, these things unfold, you can begin to ask the question, what is the deal with God? Like, why does he continually use broken people to do mighty things? And then we can begin to, to look around our, our own lives, and, and you can begin to ask the question, why does it seem like everyone in the Bible, everyone in my small group, everyone in my church, everyone in my office, everyone in my family, everyone on my block is broken? And if you look at it from that perspective, you can begin to think, maybe I should just run for my life from all of these broken people. But when you are tempted to run from all the brokenness, when you are tempted to abandon relationships or jobs or your church because of the dysfunction around you, what I want you to remember is this, that we are all broken in some way. All of us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what I want you to know is that not only are we all broken, but that God doesn't run from brokenness. He runs towards it. That God doesn't run from brokenness. He runs towards it. That God's love over you and for you and in you is not conditional upon your ability to be unbroken. Your ability to do things right or, or perfect or well. That God's love is not conditional upon any of your life circumstances. That his love is a constant regardless of whether or not your life is a constant. That God doesn't run from brokenness. He runs towards it. And God uses broken people because we are all that he has. We are all that he has. And I love that these men and women in God's word were not just broken in small ways. I love that they were broken in really big ways. Because if, if it was all just little minor areas of brokenness, we might be tempted to look at their lives and say, well, they really weren't that bad compared to me. They really, but I'm telling you that as you go through the pages of scripture, we find that there were some despicable people that God ran towards, that God transformed, and that then God lifted up and used in powerful ways. It doesn't help to run from brokenness because no matter how far you run, there will always be brokenness around you and there will always be brokenness in you. No matter how far you go, no matter what you do, whether you change jobs or get, uh, get a new family or find a new church or whatever you do, no matter how far you run, there will always be brokenness around you and there will always be brokenness inside of you. And so friends, embracing our brokenness is one of the keys to experiencing the fullness of what it means to be the beloved. Embracing our brokenness, listen to it again, is one of the keys to experiencing the fullness of what it means to be the beloved. And some of you are like, this pastor is crazy. Why would I want to embrace brokenness? You're thinking, if, as, when, I embrace, when you embrace broken things, you get cut. But this is one of the deep, beautiful truths of the good news of Jesus Christ. That embracing our brokenness is what allows us to be made whole again. That facing it, bringing it to God is what allows us to be made whole again. God wants you to bring your brokenness to him so that he can embrace it. Listen to what Psalm 51 says. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. And what the psalmist is saying here is he's, he's saying, there's a whole lot of things I could bring to you, God. There's a whole lot of offerings I could give, a whole lot of sacrifices I could give. There's a whole lot of wealth I could give or, or burnt offerings that I could give, God. But what you really want is little old broken me. 
What you just long that I would bring to you is my own heart, my own life, my own reality, my own pain, my own brokenness. That this is the offering that God wants you to bring to him. God wants you to bring your best, but friends, no matter what you bring, your best will always be flawed, and that's okay. There will always be a bit of brokenness, and everything we have and everything we give, and even though we know that is true, we still struggle with this truth because we've learned that things that are broken have no value. And we've learned that from our throwaway culture. We live in a throwaway culture. Uh, just this week, as I was sick, I, w- I was talking to my wife and I said, I can't find the thermometer and I can only find the old one. Uh, and that the didn't work and all it needed was a new battery. But then she reminded me, oh, we didn't go get a new battery for it. We just bought a brand new one that looked like the old one. Because you just throw away. If it's broken, it's more of a pain to fix something than it is to, uh, just to get a new one. So we live in a culture that says, don't fix it, it's broken, throw it away, it has no value. And it's a really easy jump to go from a thermometer or uh, an appliance or a phone or a watch or whatever it might be. It's a really easy jump, an easy shift. If, if everything in our life that gets broken should be thrown away because it's worthless, what about our own lives? What about our own offering to God? Some of your appliances, I'm convinced, I don't have any statistics to prove this or any research, but I'm convinced that some of your appliances are engineered to break. And they're engineered to be broken in such a way that they're nearly impossible to fix. A few years ago, uh, our dryer stopped working and it was one little part of our dryer and it was gonna be more money to have it fixed than to buy a new dryer. Because our whole culture is built around this idea that broken things aren't worth fixing. You shouldn't fix it. You should just go and consume something else because that will make it work. That's what our culture has been teaching us. But the problem is is that life doesn't work that way. By the way, I fixed that darn dryer. I did it myself too. The part costs like $5. It was a labor that was going to make it cost more. It took me a whole lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> Listen, YouTube, if YouTube can fix my dryer, God can fix you. Okay? Write that down. It's the truth. The throwaway culture doesn't work the same way in our lives. We can't just go out and buy a new life, but we sure do try, don't we? We sure do try to replace it. We try to hide our brokenness. We try to mask it with success. We try to conceal it with false pride and accomplishments. We try to cover it up with a smile that only goes skin deep. And God comes to you today. And if you are willing to quiet yourself and listen, if you're willing to pause and step out of this, this hiding, this masking, this concealing, and this running for just a moment, you would hear God say to you, stop trying to pretend that you aren't broken. Stop pretending that everything is okay and that everything is perfect. God says, let me examine your life. Let me see the, the whole thing. Let me help you identify the broken places and then bring that brokenness to me. And know that as you do, that there's nothing broken about you that will change my love for you. The condition of your life, the condition of your heart, the condition of your relationships, the condition of your job or your interior thought life, none of that brokenness will change my love for you because my love is rock steady. It existed before you moved towards me and it will exist after you are gone. He says, bring your brokenness to me as an offering and I will make you whole. Bring your brokenness to me as an offering and I will make you more than whole. I will make you fruitful. This is beautiful. I love this, guys. And not only is our brokenness a reality, it's a necessary part of your life. 
Because you are his beloved, God wants you to be whole and fruitful. But in order for you to be fruitful, you have to be broken. And this is the truth, is that fruitfulness comes out of brokenness. Fruitfulness comes out. It's a, it's a natural result of brokenness. And until you are, are willing to admit that you're broken, until you become broken, you will never be fruitful. This is an, uh, an image that we see all throughout Scripture of fruitfulness. And honestly, for a lot of us, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it's, a, it's an image that comes from agriculture. I grew up in Kansas, y'all, so I get it. I understand these, these images. And the, and the Bible is filled with them because that's what those people knew. That's what these, these early believers knew. They understood agriculture. Jesus described his death using an image of a grain of wheat falling to the ground. And this is what he says in John 12. He says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it it dies, it produces many seeds. And then he goes on and says, I want you to model your life after me. And you're like, say what? He speaks these words and says, Unless a kernel of wheat dies and falls to the ground, it's a broken thing, right? Right? It can't split open and bear fruit and bear much fruit at that. And he says, I want you to model your life after me. In another story, he talks about seed that's scattered all over and some seed falls on thorny ground and some seed falls on rocky ground and some fruit starts to grow and then gets choked out and other fruit, uh, other seed falls in fertile ground and grows up and produces fruit and produces abundance. Uh, In the book of Hosea in the Old Testament, God is talking to the people of Israel and he says, "The, the, the, the ground of your heart is like hard soil. He says, your, your, your heart is hardened, and what needs to happen is we need to break the ground up with a till. And then you, you need to plant righteousness in your heart. And when you do so, uh, what's going to happen is love is going to bear fruit in your life. Over and over again, we see these images of agriculture, of a seed getting planted and, and ground that's been broken up so that something beautiful can rise up. It's beautiful, but it doesn't always make sense to you and I. And so what I want to do is I want, to, I want you to, to give you an image of what that looks like. Uh, from, a, from a kid that grew up with a dad who was a farmer in his youth, I think I get this. The way that it works, the way that a seed can bear fruit is that first, hard soil must be broken up. I want you to think about your life. What parts of your life have become hardened soil? The parts of your life that you've walled off from everyone else? The parts of your life that you've walled off from God? The first hard soil must be broken up before a single seed can be planted. If your backyard is dirt and it is hard packed dirt and you throw a bunch of grass seed out, guess what? Very little of it will grow. You have to break the dirt up first. Break the hard up. Uh, earth up first before a single seed can be planted. And then that seed, you don't plant living seeds, you plant seeds that have died. They have to be buried in that broken up soil before they can begin to grow. And in order for that growth to happen, guess what? The seed has to be ripped apart, has to be broken and crushed. And that shell on the seed is, is ripped apart and a new shoot emerges from inside of it. It and begins to push its way up out of that soil. The clouds that, that are above us, we, when, when they open up and it rains, what do we call that? We say the cloud breaks and rain falls and waters the seeds. I want you to imagine the, the wheat seed that, that Jesus is talking about, this kernel of wheat. I want you to imagine that the ground gets broken up and, and the seed gets planted and the, and the clouds break and, the, and the, the shoot comes up and the wheat reaches maturity and then it's cut down. And then what do you do? You take that, that fruit from the wheat, the, the grain from the wheat, and you grind it up and you, break, and you break it up and you mash it up so you can make flour, so that you can make bread, and then you rip the bread and you break the bread so you can eat it so you're body can be nourished and you can grow. There would be no fruitfulness in that process without brokenness. And the same thing is true in your life and in mine. That the whole process of growth, the whole process of maturity is a process of breaking and building, breaking and building, breaking and building over 
and over again. And we begin to realize that becoming whole and holy, becoming fruitful as a believer, as a human being, is dependent not only on, on our ability to admit that we are broken, but to embrace our brokenness as an opportunity for growth. And yet we still struggle with this over and over again. We talked about the Apostle Paul earlier. We talked about him starting out his, his story as a zealot Jew who persecuted Christians. And then we find him later uh, writing to other Christians and starting churches. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about his own brokenness. He talks about his own ongoing struggles that he has had in his life. And in his situation, there's a, a, what he calls a thorn in his side. It's kind of an ongoing issue with brokenness, and he begs God to take it from him. He just wants it to not exist in his life anymore. But then this is what he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He begs God, and then, but he said to me, meaning God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God says to him, don't beg me to take away all brokenness from your life because your brokenness is the spot where fruit is grown. Your, your brokenness is the place where my love penetrates and transforms you and changes you. When you reveal your brokenness to me, when you bring your brokenness to me, it's what creates true, true union between us. I want you to think about your closest relationships. There's things about your life that are broken in your life that you don't share with anyone with, or with most people, correct? There's things about your life that, that are broken that you don't want everyone to know, right? But hopefully for each of you, there's someone in your life that you're close enough with that as you grow in a relationship with them, as you grow in intimacy with that person, you come to a spot where you begin to share those things. When you share those things mutually, what happens to your relationship? It thrives, it flourishes, it creates an increased bond together and the same thing happens with God. He says, increase your intimacy with me by bearing it all and as you do, what's gonna happen is in that place of weakness, in that place of deficiency, in that place of, of hurt, in that place of pain, I'm gonna insert my power. I'm gonna insert my love. I'm gonna insert my grace and my power will be made perfect in your weakness. He says, don't Run from your brokenness. Don't try to hide your brokenness. Don't try to mask your brokenness. Accept it as an opportunity to bear fruit. Offer your brokenness to me, God says, and I will cause you to flourish. I will cause something to grow up out of that dead, hurtful, broken space. Because he says, my power is made perfect in your weakness. I love what Lisa Murray says about brokenness. She's a writer and a blogger, and she says, brokenness keeps me planted in the good soil of redemption. Brokenness keeps me drenched in the love I cannot live without. Brokenness is the one thing that keeps me reaching for, clinging to the truth that molds me and transforms me into who I am not yet, but who I am becoming. Brokenness does not make me weak. It is perhaps the strongest part of who I am because in my most broken, wounded, fragile places, I know that he is strong. It's so beautiful. There's a, an ancient art form in Japan that I don't claim to be an expert on. It, it goes all the way back, you can trace it back to the 1600s and maybe even earlier than that. And it's a practice called kintsugi. And kintsugi is this incredible thing. It's this incredible art form where they take broken pottery and they remake it by taking the broken pieces and fusing them together with a, a compound, a mixture of, of like a, a glue and gold or silver foil. And in, and in this community, in this, in this community of artists, what they believe is that the broken pieces, when they're rebuilt, can actually become more beautiful than they were before. 
What they believe is that, is that, is that this, this pottery, that, that even though it's broken, it can be repurposed and rebuilt. And you can, you can take the gold and you can weave it through the pot. And that it actually is more valuable now than it was before it was broken. That it's more valuable in its new form than it was in its original form. That they can take something that is, it seems like it should be discarded. Seems like it should be worthless. Seems like you should just give it away or put it in the dump heap or give it to someone that's less fortunate than you. No, they say, let us take that. And we're going to mix something else in there, gold or silver. And we're going to rework it, recraft it, and and present it back as something that is more valuable than it ever was before. And that's what God wants to do with you today. He wants to weave his love into your life. Fill in your broken, hurt places, your painful places with his grace. He wants to reform you with his mercy. He wants you to bring your broken spaces, your broken life to him and offer them to him. And he wants to say, listen, let's rebuild that. Let's remake it. And when I'm done, God says, you're gonna be more valuable than you ever were before. You're gonna be more beautiful than you ever were before. You're gonna be more full than you ever were before. You're gonna be more hopeful and more grace-filled than you ever were before. And everyone will know that you are my beloved. First, we declare that we're taken. And then we choose to step under his blessing. And then we embrace our brokenness. And what we do with that brokenness, friends, is we, we allow it to, to sit under his blessing. That blessing we prayed over you last week, your brokenness can sit under that blessing. And when it sits under the blessing, it becomes transformed. And the question for you today as we, as we continue our worship is are you willing to stop running from your brokenness and instead turn around and run towards the arms of God who is waiting for you with his arms wide open? Because God doesn't run from brokenness, he runs towards it. Will you accept that as truth? And will you allow God to make you whole again? Would you pray with me? Jesus, I worship you in this place, thanking you and praising you that you use broken people because that's me. That's us. That's everyone that walks this earth. And so if you're here today and you are just really aware of the broken places, of the deficiency in your life, the inconsistencies in your life, I just pray right now that that you would take those all those things, the things you're aware of and the things that you're still struggling to come to grips with and you would just offer them to God. I want you to imagine all of your brokenness piled up in your hands. I want you to imagine in your mind's eye offering those things to God and that he takes them and he makes them beautiful. I want you to imagine that he takes it and he, and he produces fruit out of it and just offer it. God, here I am, all my brokenness given to you. Forgive me for the ways that I've tried to do it on my own. God, forgive me for the ways that I've tried to run. Forgive me for the ways that I've tried to mask it. I've tried to hide it. I've tried to compensate for it. God, I choose you. I offer myself to you. A broken heart, a contrite spirit, God, you do not despise. You love it when we do this. So we offer ourselves to you and we pray that you would make us whole again. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ.